Okay. Uh, my wife told me, KJ, you need to realize that you're already 73 years old. You're still doing things like as if you're 35 years old. Yeah. So if there are any shortages in what we're doing today, please excuse uh, dementia and everything else you can blame. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are ready to go. The first order of business is we need to understand who Tanchipur was and why does Omsi organized a lecture on Tanchipur, named after him. Why did we do that? So we have invited one member of the family to just say in a few minutes who their father was. So please enjoy and understand who Tanchipur was. Thank you. Very good evening. I think his life is somewhat well. Hi, a very good evening. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. K.G. John and uh, the board of OMG for organizing this digital talk um, in a series of uh, commemorating my late father, Tanji, Dr. Tanji. My name is Dr. Dr. Gan Ki Wong. I think his life is summed up well in an autobiography from British point of the opposition. My late father came from a very poor family in Chiras. His father was a farmer. But despite all these odds and having lost a uh, one eye in the unfortunate traffic uh, incident, he overcame many, many odds. My late father's life can be summed up in three phases being a doctor, being a member of parliament, and an author without fear of favor. And he believed very passionately in the value of education. He was a loving husband. My great mother is a Fon Sui Liu Fung Yi and a loving father to three sons and three daughters. I think the most important thing my father passed on to all of us, to his friends, and to the nation at large is values. Uh, some of the values that uh, he stressed was hard work, being humble, value for money, honesty, integrity, and being a responsible opposition. Where the government did well, he praised it, uh, but he criticized severely when things were not well. So with these parting words, I wish Omsi all the best for the future. Thank you.
Thank you. This is the third in a series of Panchikul lectures. The first was given by Dato Ambiga. The second was given by Mar Maria Mota, who flew her down from London to give the lecture. Today is the third lecture. And Dato Sri Hishamuddin will give the lecture. But before that, I want to get you all a bit loosened up a bit through my version of socialization. Okay, my version. Uh, how many of you have seen this book? No, not that, not that. The one on the table is not the first book. This is the second <laughs> book. All of you on the table can take a free copy. There's 10 copies on each table. It's for you, okay? Feel free to take a copy. If you want to take two, please go ahead and do it. Just make sure you give it to somebody who will read it, not throw it in the trash can. Uh, I need a brave volunteer to come and tell me what they see on the picture of this book. Any brave volunteer. You get the book after that. It's out of print, so there's one chance to get a book. Any volunteer? Come, come, please. I see a hand up there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have to say what you see on the cover of the book. Alama, oh, in God's name. Uh, like everybody, KJ John. I see, uh, I see Malaysia is the most beautiful country in the world. <laughs> okay. Uh, we got a few other books to give away. Who came from the furthest location to come here today? Sabah. Sabah. You actually flew in from Sabah. Yes. Okay, come and get it. Wow. <laughs> he said he flew in from Kota Kinabalu. That's my assumption. Yes. Uh, so you 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 win the book. How come? Uh, he said he's got it on the table, so it's another extra copy. Okay, let me quickly say why did I write this book? It was not. I wrote columns for 13 years weekly in Malaysia Kini and didn't get paid for it. Okay, I took I chose to write three. But then after all the controversies that were going on in the country. When they banned the word Allah, except for Sabah and Sabah, my retort was Alama. <laughs> and after my retort, Kamala became vice president of, which is the reverse order of the United States. Okay. I have, you know, we all somewhat experienced. So a rose by any other smell is the same, right? So we are debating over who. Almighty is. And we're still quarreling over it in many different ways. So I just told you a bit. Four others who wrote with me are Zaina Anwar, Marina Mahade, Tuku Abdi Mukris, and Azmi Saro. They wrote independently their views about the issue, Allah issue. And it coincided with my view. With their permission, I published it. So who wants the second copy for free? Please, come to get it. Okay, on your table, there are Alama 2. Okay, look at the cover and tell me, anybody who tells me what is it is portrayed by Reza, Fami Reza, who drew the artwork, okay? Yes, yes. What is it I'm trying to portray on the cover? Just give me a sentence. Yes, please. Come. Oh, it's a beautiful Malaysia, but the other part of Malaysia is suffering. Thank you. Justice. Thank you. Oh, Malaysia, but the other part is real thing. Yeah. The other half of the is real thing. So uh, the real thing problem is still here with us. We're still real thing, okay? Yep. The unity government is trying to unite us, but we are not yet united. Uh, 
who has never, who has been to Tan Chiku lecture one, two, and today the third one. Anybody? Wow. Both Krishna and Natin Padukka, Komala are good friends from Lekla, although Lekla keeps his house from hosting this event. <laughs> okay, who is the youngest person in the room? <laughs> What's your age, man? What's your age? 23. 23. Anybody younger than 23? Oh, even younger. 22. Oh, another one. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to ask you the oldest now. How old? 20. Okay, all three. 20, 21, 22. Thank you. You know, I'm a grandfather and we have two grandchildren here and four others elsewhere. Uh, I told my oldest grandson, do you know your name is mentioned in the book? He couldn't believe it. So I said, look at chapter 14, book one. He ran and he had tears rolling down his eyes. I was touched by that. So I gave him a personal copy yesterday, signed by grandpa. Okay? <laughs> but what was, what was it that he was touched about? Before my dad passed, my dad passed in 96, short of one month, short of 97. He was a proud Sugaptanian. Uh, he stood for election in 1953 in local council and got elected for town area of Sugaptanian. Very proud Malaysian. Okay, he sold medicine to Mahadev for 12 years. All of that, we, oh, he was a pharmacist. So for 12 years, they did business together. Even that is documented in a book. So, as a proud Malaysian, we must understand the history of this country, not just postulating fake theory histories, but understanding the real history. You know, so I get very upset when anybody calls me Pandatang. I didn't Datang from anywhere. I was Datang was Nyetani. <laughs> My parents, maybe you can call them Pandatang. I'm willing to accept that. They just, my dad came at age 19 from India. But you call me Pandata, you sort of blampau. Okay, can I talk about? <laughs> so, I really want to see young people reading more. So, two more books. Who wants? This is not the formal part, it's just a gift giving session. Please. Yeah, again. Okay, folks, now I'm going to say something before we that to see Shamudin to give his full lecture, okay? Yeah. I need my help of Bhattu Jai, who is my son-in-law, and his dad, Dato Victor is also here, his dad from Tungaru. <laughs> and uh, brother Dato Stanley is also here, Stanley Isaac. For those who know them, Dato Stanley was the DPP under Tansi Abu Talib, I think. Okay, I'm just going to take a few minutes to give my simplified version of my complex ideas, okay? I dumbed it down and um, one or two good friends told me it's okay, acceptable. So, I, from my work and doing my doctoral thesis on dignity in the workplace, I came to uh, what I call the AIDS paradigm. We all belong to a place. We all belong to a place. Kalai datang dari Sungai Tani, you are orang Sungai Tani. You come to Kalakangsa, you are orang Kalakangsa. You are in Sibu, orang Sibu. We also have spaces. This is a new word that came out with the internet. The place 
it's a place, but the space is bigger than a place. So we are all on the internet, we are all on WhatsApp. That are spaces. Now, can you break the law in spaces? Our police says you can. You send a not so friendly note about something that's not true, they may charge you. Because under multimedia act, we allow for any kind of communication to be recorded. The third is spaces, spaces. Ayamuka. In all of the East, space is a big issue. Space is dignity in, in a simple definition. So all I'm saying in this three by three matrix is there's a place and there's a public place, they are public places. So if I go to Kotabaru Klantan and I'm waiting with Tupu Mahale to say Kap, Tanshi Tupu Mahale is a good friend, a college mate. I go there, I want to wear shorts in Kotabaru and see if, why should they arrest me. It's a public place. It's a public place. Why should they arrest me if I wear shorts? Ladies, you can quarrel now, like, indecent, this, that. But a guy wears shorts. Okay, what? Well. Social spaces. There are a lot of social places, but in Lake Club, they believe that this event is too political. So they didn't allow us to host it there. So this is the second time RSC Dataran is more mature than the other art. I said maybe you have better leadership in RSC, okay? Maybe they all came from the other side. Uh, and then you have Private places, right? The individual. In my home, this actually happened. Somebody accidentally drove a car into our yard, broke the fence, and turned turtle and landed upside down in our yard. And within one hour, all the tow trucks in PJ were there. <laughs> they see a business opportunity, okay? They want to tow out the car. All the three ladies were fine. One, two were darting, the other. They were all fine. Nothing happened to them. Kalisa is a good car. You want to go turn that <laughs> over. So they all tolong, tolong, and they got out. And then the, all the top trucks, some of them came into my house. I told them, who gave you permission to walk into my neighborhood, uh, into my house? This is my home. They looked at me, sergeant. Simply say, sergeant. <laughs> I said, call the sergeant here. You get out of my house until the sergeant comes. Don't let me leave. See there? They left. When the sergeant came, I told the sergeant, don't come into my house. You don't need to come in. You just need to report the problem. Problem is the Kalisa is lying in my ground floor level. You just need to. But when you bring a tow truck, all these little one-time tow trucks will fall inside. I don't need two cars parked in my house. So please bring a three-time tow truck, tow the car out, but don't break my blue pine branches while you tow it up. It's not unreasonable. But they did it well. And it so happened in those days I was still connected. I called my friend in Bengala and said, I don't even know an insurance to come here, just pay. We didn't move. They moved. They jumped into our house. It's all their problem. Nothing to do with us. And I got fully paid for it. So the point is, these are not artificial constructs. They are real concern. Space, rule of law, spaces. That's what we're going to debate today and understand. Discretionary enforcement of rules. We've called it go darja in the country. Some offenses you see, other offenses you don't see. I don't know why. Private personal spaces of conscience. Siti Kasim is here. She's very outspoken. She's a speaker today. But she speaks with her conscience and she speaks on behalf of Rangatri. Nothing wrong with that. She's arguing their case. She's a lawyer, called to the bar. I'm called to the other bar. <laughs> <laughs> so while we need to understand cultural sensitivities, it cannot reach the level of Malampau. OK? I'm serious. If somebody publicly calls me Pandatan, I'm ready to take them to court. Not for, because I think lawyers are so good. Because I think a lot of lawyers also compromise on settlements. But because it's a violation of my dignity, my faith, I have no other country to migrate to. I'm born Malaysian, I hope to die in Malaysia. So please don't tell me otherwise. I am a proud RMC boy who learned how to shoot all. Yeah. 
shared common guideline. We need shared common guidelines for all our shared spaces, and then we need citizenship and cultural rights thinking. We need to improve the thing. So that's just the framework, okay, to help as that see Shamudin gives a lecture. I hope we can make more sense. With that, allow me to do one more small protocol thing before we invite Dr. C. Shamudin. There are two living SPs in the room with us. What is an SP? I should have kept one more book to do that. No. This is the highest award in Malaysia called the Victoria Cross, equivalent. And protocol wise, it's higher than even the Southern. The award, okay? Protocol wise. We have two living SPs here today. Can I invite them to stand? Just stand. Yesterday they were recognized, and I want to invite them. Daniel Malagopa, who gave up his seat in Fortixon, and we're still angry with him. <laughs> he will say a few words, and then we'll, they have to run up to the airport, one of them. So we'll just recognize them, give them a gift, and then they can leave. Please. Can I just uh, speak from here? Right, John didn't uh, to explain what SP is all about. It's a uh, Sri Pahlawan Gaga Pakasa, in short, SPE. This is the supreme gallantry award in the country. And at the moment, there are only five living souls who are uh, recipients of this award. And uh, we are very proud and glad to have two of them amongst us here, but the other three couldn't come. We had a, a media conference yesterday, last uh, evening, with the press. We managed to get two of them there. Very briefly, Dato Paul Keong uh, joined the police in 1964. Okay. He was awarded the SP for an incident. Well, he was one of the pioneers who actually penetrated into the communist uh, organization. And he lived with them for almost six years. Uh, very dangerous uh, life. But he, uh, after, in 1983, uh, the incident in Perak, one of the very serious incidents where he was uh, recognized and awarded the SP. The next is uh, Itim. Itim Bijang is from Miri. We flew him say, all the way from Miri to give some form of recognition because these are the forgotten, forgotten souls. Itim's e award was given in 1973. He was a corporal and um, 86 years old. Said to say that he got a hearing and also cannot be speak uh, well. So he is here with us. Uh, his daughter actually accompanied him all the way. So these two gentlemen, I, I feel, should be given a due recognition by people like like minded people like us. Even though the nation is more like not forgotten, they are getting their allowances, which is way backdated 2000, I think. So, I don't know how many years has never been reviewed. Okay. So, this is one of the problems of all veterans today. Okay. No, uh, the recognition is uh, short of coming. Okay. It's sad, but it's a fact. There is gentlemen, Dr. Paul, and Ethan. My good friend, last name, Dr. Danny Ignatius, is from the same depot. He's just handing over a gift to both of them because Corporal Ethan has to take leave. He's flying back. So, can he just hand over the gifts to both of them? Thank you. Thank you to both of them. Thank you for serving the country and being injured in the process. Either you or your colleagues have paid for their life. Thank you. Okay, now with this preliminaries out of the way, I get the privilege of inviting Dr. Sri Shamudin Yunus. 
retired judge from the appeals court. Uh, people have strong views, you know, about Tatasri Shamudir. Uh, but I don't know him personally until he told me when the last time he invited him to give a lecture and hosted him for lunch. He said, KJ, we met many years ago. You don't remember. I said, yeah, I genuinely don't. How could I have met you? He said, oh, Malay College RMC Games. <laughs> I came as a 17-year-old boy to play tennis. You were RMC tennis captain. Non-playing tennis captain, but tennis captain. So it was a privilege to meet him like that. And now today is my privilege to invite him to give us the lecture. The lecture will go for about 40 minutes. So please take the time. It will be on PowerPoint. You can follow the lecture. Then we'll have the respondent. With that, may I invite Dr. Sri Shamudin Yunus to come and give his lecture. Thank you, Dr. Kenji Jong. Distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. I want to just and a very good morning. First and foremost, I wish to congratulate OHMSRT number five in partnership with Gabungan Burkina Malaysia for organizing this third Tan Chi Kun lecture on the topic. The nation contours of federal constitution, negotiating between the sacred and the regular. I also would like to thank the organizer for the kindness in inviting me to deliver today's talk on this interesting subject. I regard it as an honor to be so invited. At the outset, I wish to express my appreciation to the travel court for its recent landmark judgment in the Nick Ellings petition in declaring that several provisions of the Kelantan Charter in Nekwan of 2019 are now employed for the invitation of the federal constitution. The federal court has held that the, the enactment of this provision by the Clinton government had transgressed into the powers of the Federation. I salute the two public citizens concerned, namely Juan Ni Ellen Zuina, of Rashi, and her daughter. Tengku Yasmin Natasha, Tengku Abu Ramli. Who I believe are in other prayer this morning for their courage and initiative in filing the petition and challenging the constitutionality of the provisions of the enactment before the federal pursuant to. Article 4 of the Federal Constitution. The judgment of the Federal Court illustrates the fundamental principle that our Federal Constitution is supreme. Every organ of government, be it the state or federal, must abide by the Constitution. As citizens, we all have what we call our basic fundamental rights. One of these rights is a fundamental right to freedom of religion. This right, like other fundamental rights, is enshrined in our constitution, 
which we call the federal constitution. Firstly, that is Article 11, Clause 1 of the position that provides a code. Every person has the right to profess and to practice his or her religion and to propagate it. Secondly, there is Article 3 of the, of the Constitution that provides that a code. Islam is a religion of the Federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a multiracial, multi-religious, and multicultural nation. Malaysia has a population of 32.2 million according to the 2019 estimate. According to the most recent census, 61.3% of the population practices Islam. 19.8% practices Buddhism. 9.2% practices Christianity. 6.3% practices Hinduism and 1.3% practices Confucianism, Taoism, or traditional Chinese philosophies and other religions. Other religious groups include enemies, six Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Baha'is. It is important to note that two thirds of the country's Christian population inhabit the East Malaysian state of Sabah and Sarawak. In these states, they are the majority. Freedom of religion or belief, including the ability to worship in peace and security, is not only our personal right, it is also the universal human right it is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, among other key human rights documents. Ladies and gentlemen, discriminations against religious and belief communities as with all forms of discrimination, causes suffering, spreads division, and contributes to a climate of fear, intolerance, and stigmatization. Islam is declared to be the federation, the religion of the federation. Article 3 of the federal condition provides. Islam is a religion of the Federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony in any part of the Federation. It is important to bear in mind that although Islam is a religion of the Federation, our constitution is supreme. What this means is that the practices of the religion of Islam, as well as that of other religions, are subject to the provisions of the federal constitution. This principle is enshrined in Article 3, Clause 4 of the federal constitution. I shall elaborate on important principles shortly. Now, on the quest, is Malaysia an Islamic state or a secular state. It is important to stress here that unlike the constitution of Pakistan, which declares that Pakistan is an Islamic state, our constitution does not declare that Malaysia is an Islamic state. 
It is also important to, to point out that unlike the Constitution of India, that declares in preamble that India is a secular state, our constitution does not have a preamble declaring that Malaysia is a secular state. If you were to go by population, since 60% of Malaysians are Muslims, it can be said that Malaysia is, in a sense, an Islamic country. But the true test is not based on the percentage of Muslim population. In order to determine whether Malaysia is an Islamic theocracy or a secular state, the appropriate question that should be asked is this, and this is the pertinent question. Two, whether the government of Malaysia is run on Islamic principles, or whether the constitution of Malaysia is based on Islamic principles, or whether the laws of Malaysia are based on Islamic principles. If these questions are asked, then clearly the answer is a resounding no. Therefore, Malaysia in this land is not an Islamic state. Is this a secular state, although not declared to be secular state in the preamble? In fact, our constitution does not have a preamble at all. At present, there's a possible lack of appreciation among some Malaysians that Malaysia is a secular state and not a theocratic Islamic state. This is to some extent due to the fact, and rather unfortunately, that the issue has been politicized by our political leaders. For example, in 2001, the then Prime Minister Tun Mahade Muhammad declared that Malaysia was an code, an Islamic state. He said this at the Garakhan Party annual delegates conference in that year. Let me say at the outset that this is a mere political statement and nothing more than that. With respect to the then Prime Minister, such a statement, although meant to be political, should not have been made, as it may cause, and indeed it has, it has caused, unnecessary confusion among Malaysians. Ladies and gentlemen, forgive me for being repetitious here. Although Islam is declared to be the religion of the Federation, Malaysia is a secular state. This is clearly pointed out by the Red Commission charged with the task of drafting our constitution in 1957, is what the report said. In the memorandum submitted by the Alliance in the Alliance Party, it was stated the region of Malaya shall be Islam. The observance of this principle shall not impose any disability on non Muslim nations professing and practicing their own religion. And this is important and shall not imply that the state is not a secular state. Note the double negative there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that Malaysia is a secular state was reiterated by our first Prime Minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman, in a speech in 1959 before the Federal Legislative Council. I quote, I would like to make it clear that this country is not an Islamic state, as it's generally understood. We merely provided that Islam shall be the official religion of the state. Now I come to case law. In the 1988 Supreme Court, in the case of Che Omar Ben Chitso against public prosecutor. The Supreme Court was moved to interpret Article 3 in an appeal against a death sentence for drug trafficking and possession of parents. 
The Council for the Appellant contended that since Islam is the religion of the Federation as declared by Article 3, and that the federal position is the supreme law of the country, the imposition of the death penalty was unconstitutional, being contrary to Islamic injunction. Now, what did the federal court say? The court rejected this argument, holding that the development of the law by the British Himalaya had the effect of transforming the legal system into a certain secular one, and that the constitutional declaration that Islam is a religion of the Federation did not mean that laws passed by the Parliament must be imbued with Islamic religious principles. For to call otherwise would be contrary to the constitutional and legal history of the Federation, and also to the Civil Law Act of 1956 that provides for the reception of English common law in this country. In the recent case of Nick Elin, and again the state of the federal court again reiterated that Nisha is a secular state. On the question of nature as a secular state, I now will touch upon the pertinent provisions of our constitution. In 2019, at a presentation in Sarawak organized by the Daya, Daya National Congress, I alluded to the federal constitution and I highlighted 10 features that uphold Malaysia's position as a secular state, there are namely first feature. While Islam is declared to be the religion of the federation, the constitution stipulates that its position is subject to the provisions on, on fundamental liberties, citizenship, the separation of the legislative, executive, and judicial powers, federal state relations, finances public services, etc., etc. Second feature, the constitution proclaims itself to be the supreme law of the Federation as opposed to the holy book of any religion. Third feature, the constitution does not create a head of religion of Islam for Malaysia. Fourth feature, the constitution guarantees the rule of law and separation of powers. That's to say, nature's laws are made, executed upon, and interpreted by three secular institutions, namely parliament, the executive, is the cabinet, and the courts. Three features. The constitution confers the decisions in parliament are made by a majority, a basic feature of democracies and not that of theocracies. Sixth feature, the constitution regard code written law and code common law as the applicable laws in Malaysia. Substantive Islamic law is not considered law under the present legal framework. It must be legislative form. Seventh feature, the creation of key religious authorities, that is, the Majid Agama, the Mufti, and the Sharia courts, are all persons who lost by a secular institution, that is, the state legislative assembly. The eighth feature, all cabinet ministers of cabinet, members of the House of Parliament, and judges take an oath of office which requires them to cook, preserve, protect, and defend, unquote, the constitution as opposed to any religion. Feature number nine, the constitution guarantees freedom of religion for all persons. Finally, feature number 10, 
there is no religious conviction respect to office or offices in the government. Thus, a person of any religious affiliation can be a member of the legislature, a member of a executive or judiciary in Malaysia. Even a non-Muslim can be the prime minister. I now touch on the opinion of scholars on Malaysia's system of governance. Professor R. H. Hickling, a professor learning in national law, writes, quote, as a general proposition, Muslim law cannot be regarded as the law of the land. Islam is indeed the religion of the Federation, just as the Protestant Church is the established Church of England. But in each case, the state is a secular state. And it is wise to keep religion out of law as well as out of politics for the two makes ill. If the personal declaration that Islam is a religion of the Federation does not mean that laws must passed by parliament must be imbued with Islamic principles, then what does the West quote, Islam is the religion of the Federation, unquote, mean? The learned authors on the question of Malaysia, Sheridan and Groves, Sheridan and Groves, are of the opinion that the words may impose an obligation on the participants in any federal ceremonial to regulate any religious part of the ceremony according to Muslim rights. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia is a federation of 13 states. Under the Malaysia Agreement of 1963, Sabah and Sarawak, states enjoy special status. According to the federal constitution, anything concerning the Islamic religion is a state matter. What this means is that only the state legislatures could make laws on matters pertaining to Islam. The parliament of the federation could not make such laws except in respect of the federal territories. In Malaysia, we have three types of courts. First, the civil courts. Number two, the Sharia courts. And number three, the native courts of Sabah and Sarawak. However, for the purpose of this talk, I will not be touching on the native courts of Sabah and Sarawak. The super courts. Namely, the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Federal Court are directly established under the provisions of the Federal Constitution. They are established under Part 9 of the Constitution. However, the Shire Courts are not directly established under the provisions of the Federal Constitution. They are merely established under the respective state laws First one for the state list under the nine, nine schedule of the constitution. According to, according to the state list, the state legislatures, besides having the power to establish our courts, are also empowered to legislate on Islam in regard, in regard to such matters as succession, marriage, divorce. Maintenance, adoption, legitimacy, guardianship, waka, religious trust, zakat, mos, and the creation and punishment of offenses by person professing the religion of Islam against precepts of Islam. Significantly, the state list stipulates that the Shah court is to have jurisdiction only over persons professing 
the religion of Islam and in respect only on matters they have been enumerated on the state list and legislated upon by state laws. However, there is yet another restriction embedded somewhere in state one of the federal constitution in the state list in item one of the state list of the federal constitution is a provision that says that Sharia or technology Sharia court has no jurisdiction no jurisdiction to deal with Islamic indictment offenses unless the Sharia court has been conferred by federal law to deal with offenses. In the, this means that in the absence of federal law conferring jurisdiction on the Sharia court, when someone is charged with an Islamic law offenses, he or she cannot be dealt with by the Sharia court, but must be dealt with by the civil court, such as the magistrate courts or the session courts. Now I come to Article 131 of 1A of the Federal Constitution. On 10 June 1988, there was a significant constitutional that the Parliament amended Article 131 of the Federal Constitution by inserting a new clause, namely Clause 1A. 1A says, the clause referred to in Clause 1, clause of Article 121, shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter with the, within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. What is the need for inserting clause 1A into Article 121? What is the implication of this amendment? The late country of Professor Ahmad Ibrahim in his essay titled The Amendment to Article 121 of the Federal Constitution its effect on the administration of Islamic law state by court. One important effect of the amendment is to avoid for the future any conflict between the decisions of the Sharia courts and the civil courts, which have occurred in a number of cases before. However, the learned professor went on to clarify, I quote, the Sharia courts shall only have jurisdiction over persons professing the religion of Islam and respect only of the matters included in the paragraph. The Sharia courts will therefore not have jurisdiction where one of the parties involved is a non Muslim. For example, in a case of custody of children. If the mother is a non-Muslim, but the father is a Muslim, the matter can still be brought to the civil court and disposed of therein, and not before the sharing. Ladies and gentlemen, this clause 1A of Article 121 has at times been misunderstood by some lawyers and with respect even by some judges. These lawyers and judges are under the misconception that any dispute, any dispute between parties having an Islamic law element in it must be resolved at the Sharia court and not at the civil courts. Constitutionally, this is not intended to be the case. And the extent of repetition, I see here again that the Shai court it can jurisdiction only one of a persons professing the Islam, the religion of Islam, and number two, in respect only of the methods that have been enumerated under the state list, and person to which jurisdiction, jurisdiction has been conferred by the Shai court by state laws, and where 
approved by federal law. Further, in the High Court case of Kadar Shah and quite recently, the Federal Court case of Indra Gandhi and the Federal Court case of Iki Putra Mubarak have made it clear that notwithstanding Article 1 a the decisions of the Sharia courts are subject to judicial review by the civil courts. I repeat, the decision of the Sharia courts are subject to judicial review by the civil courts. I shall take this opportunity to say a bit more on the case of Indra Gandhi. I take the view that our secular system of government is one of the basic structures of the nation constitution. The case of Indra Gandhi concerns a Hindu couple, a man and a wife, with three children. Several years into the marriage, the couple's relationship soured. Husband left, converted to Islam, and took physical custody of the youngest child who was 11 months old then. He then took steps to convert the, the children to Islam. The conversion was registered, registered by the parent Jamal Agama Islam. The wife sought to set aside the conversion in judicial review proceedings on the grounds that the conversion was not in accordance with the procedure as prescribed by the relevant enactment of parent. The High Court granted the release sought and set aside the conversions, and in my view, right. However, unfortunately, the Court of Appeal by majority reversed the decision on the ground that the ordinary courts had no decision to deal with the subject matter of the review. It held that the matter was within the exclusive, exclusive province, province of the Sharia court. On further appeal, the federal court reversed the decision of the court of appeal and restored the decision of the high court. Significantly, in its ruling, the federal court restored the full judicial power of the judiciary, which is perfectly, perfectly removed by parliament through an amendment to the constitution in 1988. Although the rulings made by the federal court do not specifically say that personally Malaysia is a secular state, nonetheless, in my view, the rulings imply, imply further entrench the constitutional position that Malaysia is a secular nation. Now I will take a bold step further to contend that in view of the adoption of the doctrine of basic structure taken by the federal court in Indra Gandhi and in other subsequent cases like Dinesh, there is no possibility of our parliament amending the federal constitution to turn Malaysia from a secular state into an Islamic state, even if one will be to give the two thirds majority. For to do so would affect a basic structure of the federal constitution. The basic structure being that Malaysia is a secular state. That must be the necessary definition of the judgment in Indra Gandhi and other subsequent judgments of the federal court. Ladies and gentlemen, on the last part of my lecture today, I will do some challenges 
to freedom of religion in Malaysia. First, on the right to propagate one's religion. Although Article 11, Clause 1 of the Constitution provides the freedom of religion or belief of Malaysia, Article 11, Clause 4 of the same has the effect of limiting proselytization. Article 11, Clause 4 provides state law in, in respect and in respect of the territories of Olupo, Laban, and Putrajaya law may control or restrict the propagation of any religious doctrine or belief among persons professing the religion of Islam. It is important to note that the cause does not empower the state legislature to make laws to prohibit the propagation of a non-Muslim religion among Muslims. It only empowers the state legislature to control or restrict the propagation of a non-Muslim religion among Muslims. Do note that the words used are control or restrict and not prohibit. However, in reality, state laws do not merely control or restrict the propagation of a non-Muslim religion among Muslims. In reality, state laws do prohibit the propagation of non-Muslim religion among Muslims. In my respect, respectful view, such laws need to be reviewed as to their constitutionality, as such laws appear to be inconsistent with the provision of laws for other level. Now I come across uh, on the issue, I turn to the issue of uh, the right of a Muslim to convert to other religions. Constantly, can a Muslim person convert to another religion? This is a controversial and sensitive question in Malaysia, especially among the Muslims. Article 11, Clause 1 provides. Every person has a right to profess and practice his religion subject to possible to propagate it. It does not provide exception for Muslim. Every person says every person, Muslim knows. In my opinion, by virtue of clause one article four, a person, including a Muslim, has the right to practice. And religion is choice, including the right to change his religion. Indeed, under the state clause one, a person has also the right to be an atheist. Let's say a non-believer of any religion. In Malaysia, when a Muslim person renounces his religion and embraces another religion, he said to commit the sin of Iftidan or Mokta, that is apostasy. Among Muslims, committing apostasy or Mokta is unthinkable. It is a big sin. It strikes at the root of the faith or Akhidah. He will be asked to repent. Therefore, to the Muslim community, the subject of Mokta or Apostasy is a highly sensitive subject. In some states, Islamic law enactments, apostasy or hibida is an offense and punishable with imprisonment or fine. I wish to make it clear, unless I be misunderstood, that as a Muslim, I appreciate the sensitivity of the subject of apostasy. And that for a Muslim person like, like myself, or for the Muslim community to renounce Islam, the Islamic faith is a big no, as that is against the tenets of the faith. 
as a Muslim, I subscribe to the belief of my faith, Islam. However, however, I, I also wish to live here in the mental small before you, distinguished audience, that I'm not discussing the subject of apostasy from a tolerant theological standpoint. But I'm here to discuss the subject of apostasy purely from a Christian law point of view. The sacred must be distinguished from the second. Some state enactments prohibit a Muslim person from leaving the religion of Islam if he or she does not renounce the religion of Islam, he or she is said to commit the offense of apostasy and is punishable by imprisonment or fine. The question is, is such a provision consistent with Article 11, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution? In my opinion, it is not. It is not. In my view, such a provision is a violation of Article 11, in my doctor view, the constitutionality of such state enactments needs to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. I now touch upon the Shia Islam issue. The prohibition of praising Shia Islam has been a concern in Malaysia for some time now. In Malaysia, the Muslims are Sunni Muslims. Of, of a Shia Muslim. Although Malaysia maintained good diplomatic relations with Iran and other Islamic countries that practice Isha Islam, over the years, many Shia followers have been arrested for merely attending close religious gatherings. The treatment intensified noticeably following the fatwa issued in 1996, 1996 by the National Fatwa Committee for Future Affairs, recognizing Sunni Islam as the permitted form of Islam in Malaysia and imposing a prohibition on the propagation or professing of Shia beliefs including the distribution of any electronic or print resources. This has contributed to the negative experience of the community. All this negative attitude so the adherence of Shia Islam are difficult to reconcile with religious freedom as guaranteed by our constitution. It is also difficult to reconcile with the fact that Malaysia is a party to the Amman Declaration of 2004 that recognizes Shia Jafri and Shia Zaidi as two of the eight recognized Islamic practices. For the Amman Declaration's endorsement, Malaysia's declaration was led by no less than a person than the then Prime Minister, Tun Abdullah Khwaja. I'll come to the last issue now. Prohibition on the use of the word Allah by non-Muslims. Recently, in the landmark case of Jill Ireland, the High Court quashed the Home Minister's Directive of 1986 and in, that imposed a total ban on the use of the word Allah in all Christians' publications in Malaysia. The London judge, Justice Norby, courageously ruled that the minister, in making such a ban, had acted illegally and beyond the limits of his powers and of, uh, under the law. The court made a finding of fact that there was no evidence that the use of the word Allah in Christian publications had led to public disorder. The court further ruled that the 1986 directive was, quote, perverse and irrational. 
Jude Arlen is a Christian from Sarawak. She's a Malay speaking Sarawakian woman from a Christian of the Malana ethnicity. She uses the Malay language Bible called Al Kitab, which contains the word Allah to refer to God. In May 2008, eight Christian educational CDs belonging to her, which contain the word Allah in that title, were confiscated by a custom officer at the Ministry of Home Affairs. This confiscation was carried out pursuant to a minister's directive issued in 1986, purportedly under Section 91 of the Printing Press and Publication Act 1984. This confiscation was carried out despite the fact that Allah had been used by the Bumi Putra Christians of Borneo for generations, for hundreds of years, long before the formation of Malaysia. The High Court further ruled that the prohibition violated June Ireland's right to freedom of religion under the Constitution and her right to, equal, to equality under Article 8. Ladies and gentlemen, I now come to the conclusion of my lecture. In conclusion, I am of the opinion that our modern constitution that declares Islam is the religion of the federation, it does not mean that Malaysia is a theocratic Islamic state in the sense that, in, in the sense that its constitution all laws or system of government are based on Islamic principles. Malaysia is a secular state. This is borne out by its personal history, by the provisions of the constitution, and by judicial pronouncements. The Article 3 declaration that Islam is the religion of the federation merely places the religion of Islam as the nation's official religion. It merely places Islam on a higher pedestal as compared to other religions for ceremonial purposes. Any discourse among Muslims in this country on, on Sharia law, or any discourse between Muslims and non-Muslims, on matters pertaining to religion must be conducted in a civil and dignified manner, in an open hearted manner, and in the spirit of tolerance and in the spirit of wanting to understand one another. Muslims should not label another Muslims as liberals or pluralists. Just because some Muslims opt not to practice, sorry, just because some Muslims opt to practice as more than Muslim or have a different view on the practice of Islam. In any cause on religion, emotions and irrationality must be put aside. The sacred must be distinguished from the second. We must be clear on this in order to maintain national harmony. I repeat that Malaysia, we Malaysians are multicultural, multi-racial and multi-religious. This must be borne in mind all the time. Finally, every nation has a duty to preserve and protect the country as a secular nation, as enshrined in the federal constitution, and as envisaged by our forefathers in 1957 and in 1963. With that, I end my, lecture, my speech, and I say thank you for everything. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Sri Shamudin. Uh, he deserves another round of in fact, I think if he was at the after dinner speech, he would have got a standing ovation. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, as a student of both Nick Rashid and Ahmad Ibrahim, in real person, both of them, uh, I welcome everything and I affirm that I will stop the same thing as a student in the University of Malaya. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to switch, and for the second part, I just want to make it clear, each of these, these are respondents, they are speakers, but they're responding to the thesis. The thesis made by Dato Sri Shambhadin has been sent to all of them. So presumably they have read it and understood it, and they only have three minutes each to make their intervention. And I will follow time very strictly. Oh, okay. Siti is already saying, <laughs> yeah, but the bell will go and we will stop. <laughs> okay. So, bell is to be for that reason, you are only a respondent. <laughs> okay, the keynote speech has been given. So, can I invite uh, Dr. James Chin, who is coming in from Tasmania <laughs> by Zoom? <laughs> Sometimes, and he has three minutes, and uh, my timekeeper friend is already put his. Uh, and for now, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I would like to thank KJ, John, and GPM for the kind invitation to say a few words in today's proceeding. I apologize for not being able to be there with you in person. Let me start off by saying that the top my laptop was a very clear and precise defense of the circular state of the Malaysian constitution. He has laid out in a systematic way the evidence to show that the constitution is circular, and I don't think many of us in this room will disagree with him. I'm especially delighted that he devoted some time to talk to the Malaysian Solidarity Consultative Committee, the Malaysia Agreement, and the background including the COBOL report and the IGC report. As a scholar of the Malaysian Agreement and the Federation of Malaysia, I can tell you that he is absolutely right when he said Islam was a major talking point during the period leading up to the signing of the Malaysia Agreement in The leaders from North Borneo and Sarawak were quite clear in the mind that when it comes to any institutional arrangements for Islam, it will only be applied to Malaya. The only thing they agreed to was the wording, and I quote, Islam is the religion of the Federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony in any part of the Federation, unquote. Some leaders, especially from North Borneo, understood the second part of that sentence to mean that there is freedom of religion in North Borneo after the formation of the Federation of Malaya. Hence, you have the famous Baku Sumbak in Kenya. Let me speak as somebody who studied Malaysian politics, and given the time constraints, I will only have several points to make. First, since 2018, toxic politics in the name of Ketuanan Malaya and Ketuanan Islam has become the mainstay of Malay politics in Malaysia. Hence, things like the original intention of the constitution no longer matters. The debate is how to create a unique Malay Islamic state going forward. Secondly, there is what scholars call a silent rewriting of the constitution towards Islam. This has been going on for many years, but unfortunately, not many people are aware of it because it is done in the legal way. Third, there is a phenomenon of weaponizing of Islam in public discourse. Some people call this political Islam, but it essentially means that everything, anything connected, has to be seen from an Islamic lens. As an example, the recent controversy of a Baku Day as a national heritage dish. This also means that you cannot discuss Islam as an issue related to public policy, as it will be framed as an attack on the religion itself. 
In other words, it may no longer be possible going forward to hold any rational discussion of how Islam impact on public policies and the common public space in Malaysia. Fourth, the old project of writing or rewriting Malaysian history into Malay history. This has been going on since the 1990s with the school history textbook issue, and but with the event on the social media, especially in today's Malaysia, is getting really crazy out there. Many of you would have seen one famous or infamous Malay professor who keeps saying that the Malays are the oldest race on earth, while another Malay professor said the Malays are descended from the Middle East. You may laugh at this, but you'll be amazed by how popular their videos are on TikTok and Facebook videos. Fifth, Malay political leaders have given up challenging the religious establishment. The Islamic bureaucracy is now working with Islamic groups of society to take control of Malay politics and they are on the ascendancy. Their ultimate aim is, of course, to rewrite the Malay constitution the Malaysian constitution to declare Malaysia as an Islamic state with Islam as the official religion. Many key Malay politicians are no longer in a position to challenge them as long as the Malay voting pattern is traveling in one direction. And finally, all these moves to change the basic structure of the Malaysian constitution is alienating many Sarakians and Sabahans. The gap between East and West Malaysia will grow bigger, and it is obvious to everyone in this room that Sarah is now trying to work on the different part. Many people from Sabah and Sarah, especially those who were born in the 1960s and 70s, feel that they did not sign up to the Malaysia that we see today. So, what does this all mean? It simply means that we, the people of Middle Malaysia, must double down our efforts and recognize that there is concerted effort to change Malaysia fundamentally and the key target is to change the Malaysian constitution. It is up to every one of us to defend the present constitution and to help everyone who is willing to listen the learned views of somebody like our keynote speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. After this, I won't come up because the bell will be operating. Okay, and the announcement will be very clear. Double double ring for a second two minutes up and three minutes will be a double bell. Okay, next can I invite uh, Dr. Dr. Johan Arifin Samad, my good friend from Saba. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me, KJ, to uh, speak and respond to uh, beautiful delivery of a secular state. And um, it's very enlightening. So, um, as speakers uh, at the table, I'm under great pressure to uh, cut our talk for three minutes, so we'll do our best. Um, Munira has about 20 pages, but she has <laughs> already done it. And Siti, I don't know. She'll go on and on. Um, the famous verse in Naya 256, Al Baqarah in, in the Quran, says there is no compulsion in religion. It's another lie in Malaysia. It's just like the English line that says that at the end of the rainbow, there's a point of gold. <laughs> there is a complex interplay, as we uh, learned through the slides just now, between secular and Islamic states elements in Malaysia, particularly in regions like Borneo, and with the amendment of summer constitution in 1973. I'm still trying to do the research for why Sabah State amended uh, that particular uh, 
or included a particular class as being a state religion in, in the state. But there were some reasons uh, which I know, but I still yet to confirm it. So the verse for Al Bakara, there is no compulsion, compulsion in religion, underscores the principles of religious freedom and tolerance within Islam. When when we always talk, we always talk about Muslims and non Muslims and non-Muslims. But I think we should also talk between Muslims who are liberal, as you mentioned, Beto, and the hardliners who have a different view. So oh, it's of us. <laughs> I just want to talk about that what your safeguards, the freedom of religion. When we sign up, join Malaysia, the first point that we mentioned is freedom of religion. And that it has been taken away from us. And by that sense, if you don't honor us, the founders, then I think we should leave Malaysia. Thank you. <laughs> If we say that Tasmania set the standard, Joe Saman cut it a bit more. What is it? Banyak You can ask during Christian time. Okay. So, next, can I have the privilege of inviting Sharifa Munira Alatas? I'm reading your sister's book, so I can talk to you sure which one I'm talking about. Please. Thank you, KJ, for um, inviting me. I'm going to be disobedient. I'm not going to take three minutes. <laughs> um, Dato Sri's um, presentation was very clear to me, uh, especially when I read it uh, beforehand. And I would like to add on, if I may, specifically about um, relating the constitution that we have uh, to the original Islam when it was first revealed, which is something we are not actually paying attention to in this country. Uh, so basically the federal, our federal constitution is in line with the fundamental philosophy of Islam, uh, which meaning to say there is a separation of the state and religion. In the history of Islam, the marriage between Islam and the state was avoidable, but subsequently throughout the historical process, the state and Islam merged which is why we speak of an Islamic state today. Um, there are two early Meccan uh, revelations that point to the fact that there is freedom to worship, freedom to choose to practice Islam or not. One of them says, O oh, unbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, and you do not worship what I worship. You have your religion, and I have mine. So this is uh, verse 109, um, or chapter 109, verse 1 to 3 and 6. The notion of liberty is invoked here in this uh, revelation, this early Meccan revelation. Another one reads, Now the truth has come from your Lord. Let those who wish to believe in it do so, and let those who wish to reject it do so. And this is again uh, chapter 18, verse 29. So this is a notion of non-coercion, coercion. coercion no compulsion in religion, in Islam. Um, now, Islamic history teaches us 
about tolerance in a multi-ethnic society. Basically, it teaches us we are a multi-ethnic society in Malaysia. If we are really truly Islamic and good Muslims, as is always the phrase used, we would be tolerant of other religions. Uh, but most of our leadership appears ignorant of Islamic history, as seen by their false interpretation on many issues. Now, in my last two or three minutes, <laughs> I would like to um, connect the federal constitution, Islam, and the Rukun Nagara. Now, lately, uh, before the 15th session of parliament opened, our king had made a reference to our recognition and our uh, respect for the Rukun Nagara. They all provide, all three ideas or philosophies apply or provide for non-coercion and personal liberty. In early Islam, as I mentioned, the first political principle that Islam actually called for was liberty. The liberty to preach and practice one's own belief system. All the later drama that came forward in Islamic history, for instance, the Hijra, uh, the raids, the battles, the conquests, and subsequent Muslim empires, they emerged because liberty was assaulted. Liberty meaning the early Muslims were persecuted by the idolaters or the believers in idolatry. Now this is the part of Islamic history we tend to ignore, we forget. Why did Islam develop the way it did and become what it is today? Islam's marriage with the state was not a divinely preordained destiny, but a historical accident. One more minute, <laughs> I'll conclude. There are unresolved intellectual, political, and social concerns we have in Malaysia. We are still dealing with it. And I think for the next 20 to 50 years, we will continue. We will continue because we continue to neglect education. We continue to doctor history. We either doctor it or we remain ignorant of history. Malaysia also lacks political leaders who have a sense of ethics and morality. They may say they are Muslim and they will start fasting in a two or three days. Uh, they go to Friday prayers, pray five times a day probably, maybe 10, some, some of them. But they are devoid of ethics and morality. The growing problems are due to our love for political parties. Now, this is my opinion. The love for political parties that are based on ethnicity and religion rather than being based on the fight for social and economic justice for all Malaysians. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Next, I'd like to invite my good friend and colleague who we all fought for something together and all lost our deposit. <laughs> Siti Kaksi. Okay, I'm running because I, I, I must, you know, make sure I'm within the time, but I know I would. So, apologies in advance, KJ. <laughs> right. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this. Um, anyway, straight on, on to what had been said, 
uh, from uh, Judge Shamudin, uh, well, uh, you know, as lawyers, we call our retired judge still as judge. Uh, so uh, Judge Shamudin's uh, presentation, uh, you know, he put forward 61% practices uh, Islam. Um, you know, <laughs> but how many really and truly practice Islam and believe in it? Tell me. I'm sure it's not all of them because Muslims are not allowed to leave Islam in this country. Okay? Period. Full stop. Okay, out of, uh, you know, a few people who applied, very few have been allowed to leave. And these are mostly converts. Born Muslim, I have not uh, actually heard that they have been ever been allowed to leave Islam. Uh, oh yeah, going back to uh, judge saying Muslim shouldn't call uh, other Muslim liberal or pluralist or whatever, but I've been called by our prime minister. I am super liberal and I am a proud super liberal, okay? Now, I, I just want to say that, you know, what happened to Muslims who actually come out from, uh, trying to come out from Islam? I just want to give you two or uh, three examples maybe one is an orang asli. Yeah, I'm supposed to speak about orang asli, but because the subject matter is mostly on uh, the problem is uh, the religion. Okay, uh, so there is one case in Pahang where the orang asli, uh, the wife suddenly converted into Islam, but because of problem and problems in their marriage, and suddenly this woman who lives in a jungle came out uh, and uh, uh, converted into Islam, and of course the child's been converted. Uh, into Islam as well, and she's suddenly wearing full niqab, covering her face and everything, and live in Trungganu. You know, I mean, this person knows nothing about their asawar, but anyway, she lives in Trungganu and defended by a group of lawyers. Okay, remember this when I say this, yeah? So, uh, why do you think that he actually, uh, she managed to do this? It's because she's aided by a certain kind of group. Now, Number two is about uh, only recently uh, in February, uh, one lady could not, uh, the highest court declared that she cannot leave Islam. Okay, because uh, she's a born uh, Muslim but never practiced Islam. Uh, she wants to convert into Confucianism and Buddhism. Uh, in fact, her mother declared in court as well that she's never uh, actually practiced. Uh, Islam, but she uh, is confirmed in the federal court that Muslims in Malaysia are trapped. Okay, so that is uh, one case. Uh, but the worst case is when um, you know this uh, one la Indian lady. She uh, she was born into a Muslim parent who converted, and uh, instead of uh, you know she uh, her life was good. She got married to an Indian guy. You know, uh, wedding uh, under the Hindu ceremony, but the problem arises when she has kids, and then uh, she cannot register her child, you know, because they insist that the child must be a Muslim. So she went to court. She was trying to get out of Islam, but she couldn't. Instead of letting her out, they imprisoned her. Okay, she was sent to a rehabilitation uh, center for 198 days. Uh, so that the punishment coming forward to court trying to leave Islam in Malaysia. Does it jive with what Judge uh, has presented? Of course not. Uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, again, in Malaysia, if you want to marry a Muslim, you have to convert, right? You cannot, uh, you know, be a non-Muslim not to marry to a... But, uh, in, so that is against uh, UDHR in which Malaysia is a signatory and ICCPR for the right of people to live together, you know, creating a family. But never mind about, about that, you know, because Malaysia has their own Islam. Now, let me, um, you know, why is it sensitive? Why is it sensitive? Because this word has been made uh, uh, as sensitive to the public. The kind of Islam that being allowed to be taught in Malaysia makes it sensitive. And this, why is this happening? Because our government, whether this government or the previous government, they are the same. They aided and actually uh, helped to, uh, to promote a certain kind of Islam. And this is because they want, these politicians are utilizing it for their own purposes. 
Islam has been politicized and being used and abused by Malaysian politicians themselves. And this is the problem, okay? The problem is our politicians. Okay, don't, don't forget that. Why we have all these problems is because the politicians, they refuse to not use religion. Look at our current government. They are still using the same thing in order to please the so-called majority. Okay, instead of not using Islam, they keep on trying to please the so-called majority. Uh, uh, we have a problem. And I have an issue about Article 1118. That is really the beginning of our problem. The problem within the jurisdiction of the Sharia and the civil court. 1988, who do you think actually amended this section? Our, our current prime minister, when he was in UMNO. Okay, he amended, he put forward to, to amend Article 1211A to include the precepts of Islam must go to Sharia. This is the beginning of the problem. This is actually being written by academics and all that. In fact, long time ago, I have spoken up about the use of religion in politics for so long, okay? And in fact, we are surprised why the Islamophasists are not using this section. But now they are getting smarter. They are using that section to say, anything you mention about Islam must go to Sharia. And you know, Sharia, of course, have their own problem. Even the, the problem with married women who wants to seek divorce, uh, nafka and all that cannot be resolved and they want to go into other areas of law. So this is the key problem. And now our current government is setting up a committee, a committee so-called to ensure that there will be so-called harmonization between Sharia and civil. Watch that space. Ladies and gentlemen, because that worries me a lot. Any kind of amendment to our constitution, we have to work out. Because what they did before destroyed what we have right now. There is a fight between Sharia and our civil court. Now, I, I want to remind people that uh, it is important that we keep track of what the government is doing in amending our constitution. Okay, uh, because this is because to me, Article One One A was the problem. Right now, we have a good batch of judges in our Supreme Court. But imagine, imagine in the future if we have a new kind of judges, what are we going to have? They will interpret according to what you know, because it is so easy for them to actually interpret according to what they want to see. And what you want to achieve, and that's what Judge uh, Judge has already said. Some judges even interpret it according to what they how they want it to be. So this is my worry for the future, the future of where this country is going. Nothing wrong with Islam, okay? To be honest, and uh, you know, I mean, to be honest, apostasy shouldn't be uh, an issue. I just want to put uh, Surah two twenty five six. Uh, as well as Surah 4137. Please check uh, what they say. Okay, uh, you know, in Tugano, if you go for apostasy, you can be killed. But of course, they can't impose it right now <laughs> because this is uh, against our constitution. But if they manage to amend our constitution, that is when you start to worry people. Okay, I do worry because I don't see. The current politicians, opposition, or government doing anything about the abuse of religion being used by uh, the politicians for their own political benefit. I can't see any of them are willing to stand up against all these Islamophati who want Malaysia to become a Taliban state. I can't see any of them. So, what is the solution, last one? <laughs> what is the solution? Because you are all intelligent here, that's why you are here. To listen to our talk. So, what is the solution, people? In the next election, do not choose based on political parties. Do not choose based on logos. You choose the person to be your representative, someone who dare to speak up in parliament for you, not to pull the party line. Yes. That is how we change. Otherwise, goodbye, Malaysia.
Beta and uh, you know, I if I had money, I would leave the country. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'm looking for you know, Benny, uh, somebody who will uh, you know, sponsor me and help me. Anyway, thank you so much. I hope I hope everything is uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now you know why we are four of us start to stand, but we still lost our deposit because you all finance us, but in the election we all lost. Okay, okay finally we have the last uh, commentator, Ravi Sundarlingam, and uh, he was also a GI candidate, and uh, he's now a student studying comparative religion. So, can I invite Ravi to make his intervention? Thank you. Ravi, you can talk. Thank you, young lady, for a very fine presentation. It was an education for me also. So, I had a question. And this person is, can a secular constitution protect all its citizens? You raise the argument that Malaysia is a secular nation and therefore secular constitution. But what I will do is I'll run through India's experience as a secular state and what dangers it presents to Malaysians. Next slide. See, India has a secular constitution since its independence in 1947. In a nutshell, it says that there can be absolutely no discrimination in the name of religion. Next slide. The government right now is run by a party called Bharat, Bharatiya Janata Party, which is a ruling political party in India. Sadly, it shares the same ideological framework as, I can't pronounce this word, but the short form is called RSS, which in a nutshell is a right wing Hindu nationalist volunteer paramilitary organization. That's what I understand the word RSS means. Next slide. So it is propagating an ideology called Hindu Okay, What is it? In a nutshell, it is Hindu supremacy or Katwana Hindu, right? Now, any form of supremacy will result in some portion of its population enjoying superiority status, while another portion of the population gets to settle being inferior. That is a result of any form of Katwana, whether it be religious or racial. So, in this Hindu ideology, it says that an Indian national identity and culture is inseparable from Hinduism. In other words, Indian equal Hindu, Hindu equal Indian. Does that sound familiar? And let you connect the dots. So there exists a right wing political movement to make India a wholly Hindu state. That means they want a religious state, no longer a secular state. Again, please uh, uh, figure out if this sounds familiar. Next slide. Okay. So what has happened is, in the state of Assam, a Hindu group linked to the BJP and RSS has given an ultimatum to Christian schools to remove crosses and other items unique to the belief system. And you can find that uh, right up over here. What has happened is that timeline has passed, and now they have taken legal action against these schools. It will be interesting to see what is the court's decision. If the courts favor them, then we know that a secular system is being challenged. We'll see what happens. This thing will go all the way to the Supreme Court, and let's see what happens. Next slide. The feedback I get from quite a number of my contacts throughout India, several things. First and foremost is Hindu ideology is gaining momentum and moving towards religious intolerance. I was in India last September and there were communal conflicts taking place which were religious based. It had to do with some ethnic or some religious group just happened to be carrying a certain type of meat with them 
that went out very badly and people were killed over this. Second thing is that people live in fear and cannot speak up due to threats just because they say something different. So, and the ruling coalition does not respect the constitution for the simple reason is they have stayed totally silent on the Assam threats, what has happened in the state of Assam, both by the federal government, which is run by BJP, as well as the state government run by the BJP. Next slide. Over here is the demographics of Malaysia. The 2010 figures coincide with the uh, young Arif's figures, and we can see them here in the way things are moving. So the question that we need to ask is, how would a religious state affect minority groups? specifically in this country, and will the federal constitution continue to be respected? I would like you to think about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Shah and Shah, when you get to his time, and can I uh, ask Brother Sri Shambhur, if you want to make any comments at this point or wait for questions? Wait for questions. Okay, we're going to shift uh, gear and allow you to ask questions, but uh, I won't be so nice <laughs> if you take the floor and then give a good bar. <laughs> All directed towards a question. Fair enough, right? You want to ask a question. But let me put it simply. We all understand the context. That's what the five, six speakers have done, given as a context. So if you want to speak, get a mic. There's a caller's mic. Just ask a question. And you have really 30 seconds to ask a question. If you have not thought about it, don't ask the question. Because it's not a serious question. Okay, uh, lunch will be served, so don't ask questions about lunch. <laughs> Thank you. So who wants to ask the first question? And after that, I will invite Dr. Sri Chamudin to engage the question that need answer. You are the only one with the privilege to answer. Otherwise, we will all mull the question together. No, I'm not putting it on the spot. Okay, so who wants to ask a question? Straightforward question from all that you have heard. Yeah, you are next. Yeah. I want to ask Dr. Sri Shamudin and all the panelists whether they agree with Sharifa Munira, who has very eloquently highlighted the, the problem that in Malaysia people do not understand the definition of secularism. Or am I you? How you got the secular? They got the you are anti religion. Whereas Sharifa Munira has made it very clear that we, as in G25 study, we define it as the marriage. We do not allow the marriage between the state and the religion. Do the panelists agree with Shri Okay, that's the question. You all can think about it. Uh, next question, please. Jana. We'll take three questions at a time. Thank you. Uh, this a specific question to Dr. Sri Well, what is the effect of the definition of Malay in the Article 160 uh, interpretation on what you have said about? Let's be uh, secular yeah. One more question, then we'll invite. One more question, anybody? Yeah. You know, some of our friends here, we, we, we are worried about the, the trend coming from the West. Our churches are worried. I think our country or Malay friends are worried of these LGBTQ movement. In the corporate sector, the IMF, World Bank, sometimes do not want to release their loan, Uganda and some African country, because of their anti LGBTQ provisions. Thank you. Okay, who wants to answer? <laughs> That's true. Okay. I'll answer on the LGBT. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I'll answer the LGBT uh, question just now because uh, I work closely with the community. Um, I, first, uh, first of all, I think in Malaysian context, you have to understand 
the trans women, uh, basically the trans women, uh, the Muslim trans women, uh, the non-Muslims are never affected, okay? Uh, uh, they, they are not charged. Uh, a lot of the Muslims uh, trans women are the one being persecuted a lot by the religious authorities. Uh, they have been arrested because each state has different laws and we are talking about Sharia law here, okay? The Sharia laws in each state are different. Like in Kuala Lumpur, you can be arrested for being a, a man dressing as a woman doing something immoral. Then only you can be arrested. But in Nukis Milad, a man dressing as a woman, that's it, you can be arrested. So there are a lot of this, uh, problems uh, with the Sharia enforcement uh, in Malaysia towards the trans women. So this is why I think uh, this is, uh, and let me tell you, uh, because uh, I can't see any of my LGBT friends here, uh, let me speak up for them. They never ask for anything. They never ask to have a right to be married, uh, uh, you know, and all that. They only ask to leave them alone and let them live peacefully like any one of us. Is that really difficult uh, to be? You know, they just go out and work, they get arrested. Just because they dress as a woman. You know, I mean, so really please understand the Malaysian context. And this is where the international community are very much against the treatment towards the trans women, especially in Malaysia. Uh, the Muslim trans women, they are the most oppressed, okay, beside the Malays, of course, you know, the Malays are all oppressed. Uh, you know, we, we are not allowed to eat, uh, uh, to eat what we want, we, we are not allowed to think, we are not allowed to drink what we, drink, we want to drink, we are not allowed, allowed to think, okay? So, yes, that is the problem that we have right now uh, with regard to this LGBT in Malaysia. I don't know about other countries, but in Malaysia, do not think they are asking for anything. They never demand for anything. They just want all this persecution towards them being stopped by the religious authorities. That's all. Yeah? So please understand that. Thank you. Two questions here. I think the first question is uh, Dr. Narimba. On the issue of the circumcision, yes, I understand. I understand. For some segment of Malaysians, especially in it's on, yeah, 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 we can hear. Especially those who um, believe in. Extremism, religious extremism, they just don't like the word second. Yeah. To them, secular is something that uh, has a negative connotation. So it's the word liberal. Liberal is, 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 is a good word, it's a neutral word, but some, some of the religious extremism, extremists, they don't like the word liberal. They give liberal a negative connotation. We have, as Malaysians, we have to change this mindset of those of people within us. We have to change this mindset. And to me, the only way to change the mindset is, you know, uh, for us to to go and influence it. Or, and the other thing is through education, edu education from uh, school, school days right until university. Yeah. In school, we have to teach the children on human rights, on fundamental liberties, on the constitution, and about religion, the various religion in society, even from school right until universities, you know, at New Zealand, right. That is a question by Dr. Narima. Next, the question by the gentleman there. Um, Division of Malay. Yes. 
to be a Malay under the constitution, you have to be a Muslim, a practice Malay culture, and born in, in Malaysia, and another one, your parents must be born in Malaysia. But what happens when a Malay, a Muslim, renounce this religion and, and embrace another religion? What happened to his Malayness? What happened? Yes. There's a bit of legal problem there. If he renounced uh, Islamic religion and the Sharia courts are very, very stingy in allowing a such renunciation as said by Siti Kasim. But in the event someone succeeds in getting to renounce this faith of some and become an, uh, an adult of another religion, my view is that he ceased to be a legal. He's still a Malik, legally, he's still Malik, yeah, but he's no longer. And a legal Malay is no longer no longer a Malay as per the federal constitution. Um, huh? Perhaps, perhaps. So <laughs> I suppose that will be the that will be the consequences on a Malay renouncing this election. Yeah, but um, I I don't come across any difficulties where such thing happened before. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Three more questions. Three more. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. My name is Sean from Kuala Lumpur. Um, I noticed two days ago the Kelantan State Assembly has unanimously reinstated the sixteen. Uh, struck off uh, enactments. Uh, we seem to be head on, heading to a head on collision with the federal court decision. So, what are your thoughts, sir? Thank you. Wait, second question. Hello, my name is Jimmy Q. I have heard so much about, we are talking about problems. I'm very excited uh, because of the, what do you call, Dato Sri. He said, reach out to everyone. And actually, uh, I want to throw a question to the to the to you, uh, especially the organizing that you can be you can be the leader to make this open so that uh, everyone can reach out to everyone every day. I believe nothing is impossible. Thank you. This is the question that can you do that? Yes. Okay, that's in that. Um, Sri, earlier on you mentioned that what uh, you you were saying that you know what happens to a Malay who wants to renounce the religion. Well, I'm a Muslim, but I'm not a Malay. I'm from Sabah, I'm Jusun, very proud Jusun too. So what happens to my Jusun? background if i were if someone like me were to renounce i know it's a bit difficult question that was i was hesitant to ask because coming from Sabah, we've got our our <laughs> native court laws and all that but the native court probably embraced that um but anyway um that was that's a question because i'm not a malay i'm a jusun all right but i was born a muslim Okay, like never ask for it, but I happen to be born on this thing. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I think that was Sri Shamudin. Uh, the ball falls at your feet. I'm not sure for the second question that I can so answer. I think it's okay, but not okay, then you don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> The first question, yes. The first question, the state government of London proposed a motion proposing to reenact the very same provisions that the federal court had declared unconstitutional for both in violation of the constitution. 
I think this is a clear act of defiance. A clear act of defiance which shouldn't be done by a state government. They should respect the decision of the federal court. The state government of London should respect the federal constitution. What they cannot do, they just do. So, besides being an act of defiance, it is also an act of futility, an act of futility. Since the federal court has declared that the provisions are unconstitutional, you can be in that it ten times. It doesn't change. It doesn't, the legality, the possibility doesn't change. It remains a state pattern in the world. Unenforceable. So, recently it was just a motion, a motion, and I don't know what is a state regret. I saw second time that means he should be advising the state government of Kelantan. You know, no, you can't do that. Yeah, you can't go against the federal constitution. You can't go against the federal court. Yeah, yeah. he should be advising. I don't know. He might be advising. I don't know for all and for all that I know. He advised and the state government just ignores him. Yeah. So that is a position. Now there is a, a clause, an article in our federal constitution. It is Article Seventy One. Article Seventy One states where a state government habitually violates the constitution. Parliament may pass a law to secure the state government to ensure that the state government. To, uh, to secure the state government to comply with the constitution. So perhaps it is here a case, it's never happened before, a case where parliament should pass a law because there's a habitual violation by the state of Kalantan. So it is here where parliament should pass a law, pass a law to ensure that the state of Kalantan advised with the federal constitution. Thank you. Now, the third question is about a Jusun who is a Muslim and renouncing Muslim. Am I? What? It's not really. Let's say he renounced whatever. Yeah. A Malay is a difficult, a different situation. Malay, because the Malay. Who is a Malay is defined in the constitution. So when a Malay Muslim renounce religion, there is personal and legal implications. But for the too soon, I don't think there is any uh, legal complication, uh, legal consequences that follow. So you you are a Muslim today, you have renounced and you have embraced an a Christian? Yeah. Christianity? No, no, it's a hypothetical question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hypothetical question. Yeah. I see. So, thank you. Sorry. Uh, that is not legal. A lot of legal question. It's just a matter of a changing of religion. Yes. Yeah. But of course, you have to go. Uh, I'm not sure what is the procedure in Sabah. There is, um, yes. there is a, a procedure for renunciation. If there's a procedure for renunciation, then you have to go to the Sharia court and apply to renounce your Islamic status. Thank you. Uh, may, may I invite Dr. James Chin? I think he has a comment to make. Go ahead, James. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, I don't agree with Professor Carter that the question about uh, whether uh, the public understands the difference between a circular state and an Islamic state. 
uh, is it a matter of public education? Uh, my answer to that is uh, the public actually understands very clearly, but there was an increasing percentage of um, the Muslim population in Malaysia who are clamoring for more Islam in the public space. In other words, if you look at the voting pattern, it is quite clear. The only product that is selling is that uh, there is more Islam in governance and in the public space. Uh, I'll just add on to what Dr. Sri was talking about the renunciation process. Sarawak uh, State actually passed, uh, the latest state to pass a process of renunciation. I think it was passed sometime around 2018, 2019. Uh, very often, it is not the process itself. It is the uh, people in the system who manage the process of renunciation who makes it almost impossible for a Malay Muslim person to renounce from the process. And they put up so many roadblocks that even though it's, it's on paper, when you actually walk through the process, it cannot be done. Uh, that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Dr. Joe, no, no. Oh, Dr. C. Shamuni wants to come in. Sorry, I just remember. Oh, sorry. sorry um... I just remember. I just remember. This is relating to the state of Sabah. A state in the state of Sabah, if you want to renounce Islam, there's a big, big problem. Go to the court. The court will ask you to repent, to repent and give some time, then get back to the court. To say that you have repent, you have renounced, uh, you have renounced, you want to uh, be back to Islam. Yes, that then it'd be okay, all is forgiven. But if you are determined, if you are you still, you still want to, re, to renounce Islam, you will be detained. You'll be detained indefinitely until you renounce until you repent. You'll be detained indefinitely until you repeat, repent. And I think such a provision, I don't know how it gets into the law of Sabbath, I think such a provision is unconstitutional because a Sharia court has got no such power to order the detention of a person who wants to renounce until the person repents. It is an unconstitutional provision. Thank you. Thank you, uh, okay, yeah, I, I really hate you because um, you gave the two ladies more time than you can. <laughs> but again, it, it, we rebel. it's Women's Day today, so <laughs> oh, yes, okay. My question to Dr. Hisham is uh, to use the word Allah between this nation, but it's a nation, and as you know, the government now has allowed words to be used in Borneo, but when the uh, uh, person crosses over to Malaysia, Malaysia, they're not. Uh, how, how is this uh, from the law perspective, law perspective applied or, or, or how is it impossible? Uh, judge, um, I have a question with regards to the Kelantan uh, so-called proposal to re-enact. Now, let's say they re-enact. Uh, in fact, currently, there are few states who have these unconstitutional provisions. Um, so what if, let's say, majority of the people who are being charged in the Sharia courts are actually the poor Malays, the non uh, the Malays who don't know about their rights. So they, they wouldn't know about uh, the illegal illegality of this provision that they have been charged. Uh, so let's say the state go continue charging these people uh, without these uh, poor victims knowing that the law that's been used against them are illegal. Uh, but the, the state went on and charged them and persecute them, and they uh, then uh, after that, uh, then only later on they realize, oh, I've been charged with an illegal law. 
what can they do when it comes to that situation? Now, um, uh, on the fact of, um, I think that's all of my questions. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, on Dr. Johan's questions, where? The High Court, Justice Norby, in Jill Ireland's case, has made it clear that uh, she, uh, any Christians, has a, a regard, it's regardless the, the, whether from Eastern Borneo, from Borneo State, or from Asamananjo, has cautionary the right to say the word Allah for religious purposes. There's nothing in, in uh, in her judgment that say, oh, that freedom to say the word Allah only for uh, East Malaysian Christians, but that right is not extended to a Malaysian uh, a Christian. That judgment is for everyone. It's freedom of religion. If you cannot uh, uh, divide according to geographical location, so the constitution does not Words that I remember, of course, I remember, of course, in the day after the judgment. I think what Prime Minister says, ah, uh, Anya Pulih Pakai, the East Malaysia study, I remember that well. Due respect, that is not right. That judgment applies to all Christians, wherever you are in this country. That's question, the question, your question is, an unfortunate law is unenforceable. It's unenforceable. So I just hope that good sense will prevail. I just hope that good sense will prevail and the state of Kantan or whatever state it is will not enforce a law on the citizens when they know very well that the courts has pronounced that the law is a violation of the federal constitution and therefore they are bad laws. Bad laws, unsmanned laws are not enforced. And should they have the temerity, the audacity to enforce this law on the citizens, the citizens will have the right to challenge it in, in the courts, yeah, and in in the course, in, in, because of the process of enforcing these laws, the the citizen suffers harm. Subsequently, when they are acquitted, they can file an action against the uh, state government for the thought of malicious prosecution. And where and here, where lawyers like Siti Kasim come in, right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. All that remains is for us to recognize the speakers and interveners, keynote speaker. Uh, I think we are running out of time, sorry. I told lunch must be served at 12.30 and we're just sticking to time, okay? Uh, and most of your questions can be asked one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Sri Chamudi because they are, may not reflect a general uh, issue of a high proportion, I think. So with that, I'd like to invite our partner in crime here, <laughs> Stanley Yong, to help me give away the gift at the table. So Stanley, yeah. Yeah, just go Thank you. 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 Next is to 
Dr. Sharifa Munira. Next is Brother James Chin. <laughs> okay, you know when you have to find somebody to pass it over to you. Okay. And last but not least, please, uh, Ravi Sudhali. With that, friends, I